Lord of the universe. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for all the opportunities you surround us with. Opportunities to bear fruit and bring glory to your name. Even now, Master, let your Holy Spirit move upon us. Let him cover our hearts and bring your wisdom, your revelation, your understanding and your guidance to us. Teach us the mysteries of the kingdom. And all we ask, Father, is let your will be done. Lord, we ask all this in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And all say, Thank you so much, Gideon, for leading us in that time of prayer and worship. Greetings to everyone. I hope you are doing well. I hope the Holy Spirit is ministering to you and that you are experiencing victory in your walk with the Lord. Hallelujah. I know that the ministrations today have continued building on what we started to build yesterday and I just want to continue in that vein. I may not even be bringing new teaching because it's not even profitable and beneficial to bring new things when the old are not yet sunk in and established. So my desire tonight is to go back and plow and plow and make sure that we water the seeds that we are planting and really that we get fruit out of it. We don't want to be hearers. We want to be doers. A people who hear and do what they have heard from the Lord. Yesterday, I began to share with you about being a friend of God. Being a friend of God. This being a friend of God is a choice you make. You choose if you want to be his friend. Because he is willing to be friends with you. Is all love and nothing else. Now, let me begin with a scripture in the book of Acts. Acts of the Apostles. These were words being given as a testimony. And uh, I will read from verse 21. And it's talking about God dealing with the kings of Israel. You know, the, the children of Israel asked for a king. And verse 21 says, And afterwards they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave a testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Hallelujah. The Bible is saying God himself gave testimony about David and said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. How would you love God to give a testimony like that for you? How would you like if God is sitting in the heavenly assembly with all the angels in attendance and the elders and all the creatures of heaven in glory and he announced, I have found James, my son. I have found Jennifer, my daughter, a woman after my own heart. She does not only love me, but she will do all my will. That's the same as she will obey anything and everything that I say. And yesterday we looked at what obedience really is. It's, it's one of those triggers of love, language of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And my father will love you and I will love you and we will come and make our home with you. The language of love is obedience, submission, 
allowing him to say, you are Lord and I am yours. That's the best language of love. And it's not spoken in words, it's spoken in action. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Yesterday, I made a statement and said, to be a friend of God, you need three things. And these three things are very simple because they intertwine and intermingle into one, one into the other. The very first one I said, you need to know how to commune with God. Communing with God involves worship, involves friendship or intimacy, involves talking to him not because of a duty, but talking to him because you enjoy talking to him. It says it's an art you develop. Just like friendship, you don't become intensely friendly with somebody of overnight. You develop it. You cultivate it. You gain confidence. You gain trust. And you gain enjoyment of the time you spend together. Someone you used to talk to on phone for just three minutes and that would be long enough. Now you can't get done with them when you sit with them three hours. You just, oh, you, you have to pull yourself away to go do other things, but you still enjoy the fellowship. And that's, that's the essence. I want us to be sincere with ourselves. How many people are in Christianity and church, but they don't really have that enjoyment with God? They don't really enjoy spending time with him. They don't enjoy talking to him. They don't enjoy worshiping him. And sincerely here, we are talking about enjoying fellowship with God. But you cannot enjoy fellowship with someone you don't know. You cannot enjoy fellowship with someone you don't know. So the next thing is about knowing who he is. And there is no any other avenue through which you can know God except through his word. Because he chose to reveal himself through his word. And people who find it difficult to concentrate on reading the word of God cannot pretend to know God. Reading the word of God is, the, is an expression of hunger. I want to know you. I want to know why you do things the way you do them. I want to know why you hate certain things and you love other things. I want to know what will move you to joy. And I want to, to know what will put you off and you turn your eyes away. Because if I learn those things, I can live on your better side. I can live in the shadow of your favor and grace. But if I don't know, I find myself doing things I think are good and yet they aren't. I remember when Jesus was talking to his disciples in the book of John, chapter 15 and even 16, he said, they will do all these things to you thinking they are serving God. But it's because they don't know him. So if I don't know God, I may do things and I'm hoping and I'm believing I'm serving God. But in essence, God is not at all pleased with me. The, re the only reason I'm doing them is because I don't know him. And the only way I can know him is to go back and get into his word. <coughs> but reading the word of God. Now, very quickly, I'll say this. Beloved out there, there is a difference between reading the word of God and studying the word of God. And, I, and in, in our journey together, we are going to go and explain that and define that so that you clearly know and understand the difference. There is a team amongst our audience together with you who are, I call, sojourners. They are in the marathon Bible reading. Right now they are reading 10, I mean 40 chapters a day. Now, that's for Bible reading alone. You try to do that and also do study, you're going to fail. You try to do that and then continue making analysis. Oh, what does this word mean? Oh, what? you are going to fail. And I'm, I'm going to say a funny statement. If you just want to know God, read the Bible as you would read a newspaper. Because I ask you a question. Why do you read a newspaper? You want to know what is happening in the land. 
You just want to know information. What is going on? So when we read the Bible, we just want to know that one thing. What is God? I'm not trying to study him. I'm not trying to analyze him. I'm not trying to scrutinize him. All I want is his story. I want the story of God. Just as when I go in the newspaper, I just want the story. And once I've read it, it gets inside of me. I can even repeat it to somebody else. I normally say, one of my best books, <laughs> just because it was funny, at the same time it had a lot of wisdom, is called Animal Farm. Animal Farm. I, I, I read that in literature in my secondary school many, 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 many decades ago. <laughs> and I was, I don't remember in the age, but I, it was in the 70s, in the late 70s. But I can, I can still remember the story of Animal Farm. I can still hold a conversation along the lines of Animal Farm. I read it decades ago. What about if you're reading the Bible? What about if you're reading the Bible every day? You would know the story of God. Now, there's no denying that. You can't deny that. You will know the story of God. Now, when it comes to study, I, I, I intend maybe next week to touch a little bit on that. Especially for those, if you're a Bible scholar, I'm not trying to teach you anything. You are in your class. But if you're one that would, would like to make better and more fruitful your life, I will be sharing with you. What is Bible study and how do you choose what to study? Some of us just go by concordances and you go by, by those analyses and you go topic to topic, subject to subject. But don't you think the Holy Spirit has got a say in what you study? Didn't Jesus say when the Spirit comes, he will teach you all righteousness and he will lead you in the paths of righteousness? What about if you allowed him to choose for you what you will study? What subject in which season? And to what depth? Because this Bible is so deep. Even if you read it and study it for 30 years, you'll never get to the end of it. So, if you're going to study any subject, how deep and how far are you going to go? Will you study it until you are to the level of a professor? Is that what you need or your life needs? At any one time, in any one season, there is a need you have of a certain truth. And as long as you get to that level for that season, the Holy Spirit will let you know, now you can let it go. Have you got to the bottom of it? No, 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 no. But you have got enough for that season. Then he will move you to the next. And when you put two and two together, you will marvel at the wonderful mysteries of God. So we want to study and I would like to share with you it's a, a pattern, a method of study that does not go by simple methods and uh, formula. It goes according to your needs, the need of the hour in your life. And what is the need of the hour in your life may not be the need of the hour in my life. We may be reading together. We may be praying together. We may be fellowshipping together. That doesn't mean we all have to study the same thing at the same time. We could... We could study the same thing, but it's not a must. The study must depend on your need as an individual walking the journey of, of, with God as a sojourner. So, we will touch that. We will get back to that. So, I said yesterday, fellowship with God, obedience in the word of God, and then willingness to stand as a steward, uh, no, as a witness not only to know the truth, but also to stand for the truth. To stand and say, uh -uh, I'm not going to do something I, am not, I, I don't believe in. I believe in him. I believe in his ways. I believe in his integrity. And I'll stand on that. Today, there are very few people who are willing to stand as witnesses for Christ. To stand and show the world that he is God. And I believe in him. I'm, I don't only want to live for him. I'm willing to die for him that possibly that is why today there are very few exploits amen there are very few exploits because people are not willing even to lay down their lives for the almighty god now those three things communing with god 
being true and obedient to his word, and then being a witness for God, they intermingle. You don't separate them. They work together. They, ming they intermingle together. And when you are trying to practice them, you will find them together. So yesterday, I, I began to share with you some practical things concerning walking the path of becoming God's friend. Hallelujah. And now I just want to walk through that, what we were sharing yesterday. I may go a little bit faster today, but I want to go, really going back, plowing again, watering again. Now, yesterday what I did not say, I went straight into the altar and the time of worship. Amen. And I assumed that a certain step had already been taken. I referred to it, but today I want to emphasize it. And that's the step of reading the word of God. A person who reads the word of God prior to going to the altar will find his time with God richer than one who has just come in and go straight to prayer. And I know many, many Christians who religiously hold their prayer time. Even when they are in a conversation there and they see it's about, oh, it's my prayer time. People, God bless you, bye-bye. And he goes from human conversation straight into the altar. Now, of course, with God there is no real loss. But you could do better. You could do better than that. And you could enjoy him better. If you ordered your life in such a way, you withdraw from other things a little bit earlier, come back, if possible, get into the word, read some. So the word of God is powerful. Do you remember the Bible says it separates the soul from the spirit? It separates, I mean, it, it can separate you from all other things and prepare you for an encounter with God. So create some time. It may not be your entire Bible reading of the day. No, but there's a portion you want to read, especially when you come and let the word water your spirit, your soul, your heart. Let it come and then meditate on it. I said yesterday something about be still and know that he is the Lord. These are simple, simple, simple disciplines. But if you make them part of your life, there will come a time you just don't even want to think how you used to live without them. When you're still, you think about him. Now, this is where I said, even before you start praying, begin to ask yourself, who is this God I am going to talk to? Who is this great being called the Almighty? Who is he? He's from everlasting to everlasting. We're not only talking about physical, geographical bigness. We're even talking about historical bigness. He's from forever and he's going to forever. You can't even wrap your hands around, your arms around that. He is infinite. He is omnipresent omniscient and omnipotent you stretch out straight. the time will come when you feel wow you cannot even expand it anymore and your spirit goes wow and let me tell you something every time when you are thinking about God and who he is what he is and what is true about him every time you reach a moment when your spirit says wow I want you to know one thing your spirit is ready to worship your spirit is ready to pour out. The moment your spirit begins to be emotionally moved, and I'm, I'm talking of emotion, not in, in the fleshly way, but to be, wow, impressed, that to be moved to a place of, wow, that is a heart ready to engage. And you can do it. I remember the first time I came to learn that, I was, it was 1988, we were there in the Luero district, and uh, one day I was just reading the Bible, and my, my partners, my colleagues had gone to fetch firewood and some food, I stayed home, and I was reading and reading and reading, and I began to say, wow, so Lord, you mean this, you didn't mean, and I was putting this together, then, oh, now I remember why, that's why he said this, and a time came, I said, wow, oh my God. This is awesome. And that very moment, I had a voice in my right ear say, now you are ready to worship. This is the moment when your spirit is ready to enter into the courts of God. 
And I didn't understand, of course, at that moment. But the Lord told me later that this is how to prepare your heart. When you want to go into his presence, this is how you prepare your heart. You make everything, you empty it of all other worries of life and you concentrate it on who God is. And as you marvel, as you see into him and his ways and his attributes, there comes that moment when your heart bows. Amen. It just wants to bow. When you reach that, you know you are, you are ready to enter the presence of the living God. And that is something you should keep as a a secret. These are the mysteries of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, I want to quickly run through these principles. One, I said, look at the magnitude of God. Now, after you've touched something there and it is beginning to move you, now bring it back and say, and you, the most high God, you, the infinite God, you, the everlasting God, are, you are here in this room. You feel the heavens, you feel the earth, you feel the oceans, you are in the valleys, you are in the mountains, you are in the winds, and yet you are also here. And you are here in this room, and you are ready and willing to receive me. Me, this little, little iota before you, you are ready to receive me. There is something that comes there when you understand. Someone so great who could do without you, loves you, and cares for you, and wants your fellowship. There's, there's something it does. If there are things that are holding strongholds and anger and you, you somehow feel, oh my God, I can let go my defenses. I can let go my worries. I can release my stress. I can rest. You know, this life is so stressful. Sometimes we don't even realize how stressed we are. But we are tense. We are defending ourselves. We are alert. We are suspicious. We are ready to Move through with victory at whatever cost until you find one who says, I have a shoulder for you to cry on. And you realize, I don't have to defend myself here. I don't have to fight. I don't have to be alert. I don't have to be suspicious. I don't have to be on the lookout. I can relax here. There is something there when you can let go. And that should be an experience for all of us every day. That is what it means to come into the rest of the Lord into the rest of the Lord the Shabbat of the Lord you come into that place of peace that surpasses understanding brother sister whoever you are wherever you are try what I'm telling you and you will see that God is good hallelujah now there's something else I want to bring to you I hope it, it carries through these uh, human words if you want the presence of God you want God to be present be present yourself. <laughs> Do you know how many times we, people of God, talk to God without being present with him? You are talking, you are even saying, oh Lord, please, uh, please, please. But your mind is in so many other places. Especially when we come to praise and worship. You sing a song, but your mind is not there. You are thinking of the bankers who are now going to come after you. You are thinking of the rent of the house. You are thinking of that appointment that you need to go to tomorrow. That interview you need to prepare. And you are wondering, what am I going to say? At the same time, you are singing. Ma you're saying, my God, my what? And you're thinking, you think he cares for that? You think he really loves that? Why would he reject Cain's sacrifice if he doesn't care? And don't you think you could fall in the same category as Cain? Sacrifices he just doesn't care about. He passes them and goes for Abel. So this is another thing. You know it's possible not to be in. You, are even, you can even be with me, seated at the table, we are talking, and you are absent-minded. Your mind is somewhere else. I can tell, by the way, if a man can tell that you are absent-minded when you are talking to him, can't God? <laughs> can't God dis tell that your mind is somewhere else? And your mind being somewhere else is another form of worship. You prefer that something else to him. God help us. Now, very quickly, I want to, when you, when you begin to focus on him, you are present with him, that is the time to start bringing your Bible reading. You remember we told you, as you read the Bible, stop and analyze who is God according to what I've read. 
What is he like? What are his attributes? What is his character? What pleases him? What grieves him? What draws him? What repels him? So it's at that moment when now you've come down, he's here and he's with me and is willing to listen to me and is waiting for me. That's when you begin to, oh God, you are this to me. I come to you, my refuge. I come to you, my provider. And you are bringing the truth about him. Truth you got from the scriptures. Not something you thought about. Even if it is something good and truthful, but it's not coming from your heart. It's not so much fruitful. You better bring that which touched you as you read the word. Was revealed to you as you read the word. That's fresh and fruitful. Now, I, 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 I say to you, you, there are many ways you can bring these truths to him. You can make it religiously. Oh, you are the this, you are the that, you are the that, you are the that. Or you can make it friendly. And God said, God, I realize as I was reading today and I saw your character. Wow, I realize you are like this. Oh my God, I can trust you in this. I can stand on you. Make it conversational. Make it yours and him. It's not about how you pray. And don't let people judge you. Today you may find you pray softly and intimately. Tomorrow you are more aggressive. The other day you are more desperate. Don't you worry. Go as the Spirit of the Lord brings it to you. Amen. And uh, then comes the next point. I just want to go to that very quickly. Uh-huh. The best part of communion with God, if you go to God and intimately spend time with him, worship him, adore him, and you don't reach this point, you have fallen far short. The point I'm talking about is the point of surrender. Where you reach a point of say, I love you so much, Lord. I revere you so much. I value you so much. I'm willing to lay down my life before you. Take me. Make me what you want me to be. And use me for whatever you want me. And then you can really make this commitment to him. Father, because your word says, if I love you, I must obey your word. I want to make a commitment now. As much as it is in my power, I promise I will obey you. I will never defy you. I will never say no to you. I will never reason with you. I will never. And make that daily. Make that daily. That is the key to surrender and submission. Why? Because the truth is, even after saying it, you'll walk out of this room and the next thing is, hmm, there's a situation. And the word of God comes and you don't want to go that way. Everything in you wants to go another way. But that promise you made to the Lord comes again. And sometimes very painfully you choose the way of the Lord because you committed yourself. Because if you don't choose the way of the Lord, tomorrow you're going to go, in the evening you're going to go back to God. And then it's going to become meaningless. Your words will become meaningless. Then you don't want to do that. So you choose painfully the way of the Lord. And then you find later, because the word of the Lord is good. And the word of the Lord is sweet. So later on, you discover the sweetness and the blessedness. You say, oh my God, I never knew. But you have already passed that. And you have already been changed degree by degree. So it's important for you to know the value of this daily commitment. I will obey you. I will follow you. I will submit to you. I will not turn against you willfully. I will not defy your word. I will not reason with you, my Lord. You are my Lord and I'm yours. Though that is surrender. And that is what we call to, to make him the Lord of your life. Hallelujah. Now there's also something else to say to the Lord. As much as there's any opportunity... Use me to show your love to others. Use me to show your faithfulness, your integrity. So you are not only obeying God, you also want to be his messenger, his reflection. You want to be a witness everywhere you go. And you never know what he will ask you to do. <laughs> but you just say, Lord, I am willing. And if I'm not, please make me willing. 
Now, sometimes we make promises to God. I remember one time when we had just planted a church in Bujiri on Entebbe Road near Buebaja there. And uh, we were encouraging these new believers and new ministers, teaching them the way of the Lord, the in communion with God, believing God, God will never let us down, and da, da, da. And then we were teaching them not only the seeking after God, but also preaching the, the gospel. So they would go out every weekend, and they would go house to house, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. Now, one time, they went to... They went door to door and they came to a house, to the home of a witch doctor. And they knew he was a witch doctor. But they went in to share Jesus with them. And the man, first of all, passed the other way around and ran away. And then he sent a message by a little kid to call his wife. And when the wife came, he said, bring me fire, bring me a matchbox and bring me some grass. And he came back and set his... his a, his heart, the, the kitchen that he set it on fire. And it really burnt down. And then he made an alarm. Ooh, come and help me. The Balokole, the born again Christians are here. They want to kill us. They are burning us down. They are destroying us. And people came. And they arrested the brethren. And they took them to the chief. And so we were in much India. They were in Bujiri. And they sent a message the brethren have been arrested for what? they said they burnt down the house of a witch doctor I said how, how, how could they have done that we always teach them with our gospel is peaceful and love how could they do that then we got the whole story and we said okay let us go let us go and we had to go and we had to go and uh, stand with them and we have where to go and uh, encourage them strengthen them show them our god is faithful but do you know what we were speaking these words encouraging them the others were in prison i mean they had been taken to police custody and we were encouraging this but in my heart i was saying oh my god you better come through this time otherwise all our teachings are going to fall apart we went to the lc we said we want our people they released them but they gave us a day. The next day we had to go for a village court case. And when we went, we prepared ourselves in the night. You saw exactly what was it. Say it as exactly it is. We cannot stand outside truth. Truth is our strength. You've got to be truthful. And we prepared all of that. When we went to the court, they didn't even give us opportunity to listen to us. Every time we're saying this, they would, people would shout and then the chief would say, Okay, tell us, and he would stand to the witch doctor. Tell us exactly. They wouldn't want, they wouldn't listen to us. They didn't. And at the end of the day, they passed the judgment. We had to rebuild the house of the witch doctor. We had to pay him a fine of so much money. And we had to promise never again to preach the gospel in the village. And we went back home. And the, one of the brothers who had been arrested was one of the affluent ones. He had a little bit of money. He had a shop. He had, uh, he, he had boats which were on the lake, fishing. And he said, people, for the sake of peace, let us pay. I'm willing to, to put down the money. Let us pay. Let us pay this man. It was a lot of money at that time. I think it was about 200,000 shillings. At that time, it was a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Maybe something like, um, over, maybe like 2 million Uganda shillings. And he said, I'll put it down. I'll pay it. And I'll also pay for the construction of his hut. The brothers will go and do the labor for me. I'll buy the materials. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, Lord, that is the easy way out. But if I allow that to happen, we are not glorifying your name. And we are not showing who you are. And we are allowing the devil to win this one. And when everybody was in agreement, oh, brother, thank you so much. God bless you. Oh, God will indeed increase you. I had to come in and say, I'm not party to that. We cannot. We cannot accept that because it will demean our God. And it means you'll make a promise never to preach the gospel again. I can never make such a promise. And at first there was silence. I could feel the engines grinding in the minds of the people. Mm, what is this spanner in the engine? But eventually, someone stood up and said, I stand with pastor. 
I am not willing to give up the testimony of our Lord Jesus. Another one said, I too, I too, I too. Eventually, we all agreed. So he said, now what do we do? I said to the brother, go to the chief and tell him, we have heard your ruling. Give it to us in writing. Secondly, give us a letter. We want to take to appeal to the next court, the LC2. And when he went there, the chief said, okay, you come back tomorrow. I'll give you the letter. Did he give us the letter? <laughs> Every time we would go, he said, hey, I'll give you. My servant has not yet written it. And in the end, they said, but you born again, what do you want? Why can't we live peacefully? We said, we can't live peacefully when you have a judgment against us. Ah, forget those things. This man was also crazy. And that's how the whole thing. And we say to them, you've got to write a letter to say the judgment has been cancelled. Eventually, he wrote that letter. He, didn't, he couldn't bring himself to write a letter to go to the higher court because he knew there was no justice. So we won the case. And above all, for me, it was not the case. It was the ability to show these young Christians that we have to stand for the name of our Lord. We do not have to compromise at all on the name of our Lord. And I rejoiced. I went back home and I said, oh Lord, you are so good. I spent like an hour just in fellowship. Just said, oh God, what would it have been? How would I have gone? Feeling I have let you down. I've told these men to succumb to the demands of the world. They will never again stand for you. They would never again preach the gospel. They would never again believe that you are able to defend yourself. Oh, I thank God. Thank you. Thank you for enabling me. Thank you. You see, brothers, sisters, these are small things and you never, you never plan for them. They will come when you're not ready. It, it must have been resolved in your mind a long time ago that I will stand. Come what me. It's not something you decide when it has come. It has to be resolved a long time ago. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. And there is joy knowing you are standing faithful to him. It may look small in other people's hands, uh, eyes, but it builds you up. Now it, it prepares you for the next challenge. Yes, then, and the other challenges will come. But you have now a testimony in your track. Hallelujah. Now, yesterday I mentioned this. That as you commune with him and you really feel you are intimate, you are enjoying the communion, you tell him, Lord, I thank you. Because you are willing to get all my challenges, my prayer burdens, I can bring them to you. You know the Bible says, cast your burdens unto him, for he cares for you. Amen. So you tell him, I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful that anything I bring to you, Lord, you are willing to take it up. And I can trust you for answers. I can trust you, O oh God. But I also want to share your burdens. I want to hear, I want to share what is on your heart. And I told you, when you open yourself to the Lord, He will bring you His burdens. He will share with you His burdens, and His burdens are not light. And they are not punitive, they are not oppressive, but they are heavy burdens. And they will weigh you down. I want to give you an example because when I talk like this and uh, especially to those who have never experienced it or when they experienced it, they didn't recognize it. Let me show you an example of God sharing his burdens with man and expecting man to carry those burdens. Go with me to the book of uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 8. Okay, chapter 8. Now, this is a long passage, so I'm going to try and uh, skip some. But when you go home and you have time, you just read the whole chapter. It's amazing, just amazing. Now, Ezekiel is a prophet, or was a prophet. And he was sitting in his room with the elders of Israel together with him. Now, these elders are the elders of the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, the, the different clans, and they are the topmost layer of leadership in Israel. And they're sitting with him. I want you to listen to this. They're sitting with him, uh, meditating on God and saying, what shall we do? There were problems in Israel that were insurmountable. And so 
they are trying to find an answer and the Holy Spirit comes and picks out Ezekiel. I'm, I'm sure it was, maybe it was not in the physical because it says here, verse 2, Then I looked and there was a likeness like the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his waist and downwards, it was fire. And from his waist upwards, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. He stretched out his form, he stretched out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the northern gate of the inner court where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. Amen. So I don't think it was in the physical. In the physical, he must have been there. But in the spirit, the Lord took him. And I want you to hear what the Lord is telling his prophet. Ezekiel is being taken into, it, into it, the spirit. Now here. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now towards the north. So I lifted my eyes towards the north and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go away from my sanctuary? Now, turn again, you will see greater abominations. So he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall and he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and I saw, and there, every sort of creeping thing, abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. Those, <laughs> those very ones who are sitting to say, what shall we do with this problem in the land? In the secret, they worship these creatures, the creepers and all that. And God sees it. And in the public, they, they are holy. They are trying to find a solution. God says, son of man, come. Let me show you. That is when God is sharing his burden. He's sharing his burden. So there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. In their midst stood Yazaniah, the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up. They were, they were burning incense to these creepers. Oh my God. Then the Lord said, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in, in the room of his idols. Hey, people, think about our situation here. What if one day the Lord showed you, come, I will show you. And he showed you maybe pastors. Mm, reverence. Church leaders. And he shows you what they do, some, some of them, what they do in secret. This is what exactly Ezekiel was experiencing. These elders were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of Israel. And, man, and God says, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, the Lord does not see. And the Lord has forsaken the land. That is what happens when God is sharing his burden. Let's keep on. And he said to me, turn again. And you will see greater abominations that they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. You know, Tammuz, according to the esoteric studies, satanic studies, is the, son of, is the son of the sun god. And here are women in the temple of God weeping for Tammuz. You know, these things are happening in the temple of God. And this is what happens when the church or the house of the Lord is backslidden. Remember the days of Eli? The priests were doing these abominable things in the temple of God. And here it is. They are worshipping other idols, other gods, other, in the temple of God, in the house of God. Verse 15. 
Then he said to me, have you seen this? Oh, son of man. Turn again. You will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east. And they were worshipping the sun towards the east. Ooh, all of this is going on in the house of the Lord. And you see, unless God shows it to you, you will not even know that it's going on. It's only when you say, Lord, share with me. I'm willing to be partner with you. I'm willing to walk with you, carry your burden. When it can trust you, when he can trust you, he will begin to show you. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their noses. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. Though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Now, what does that do? It gives you the attitude of prayer. Instead of going to say, Oh Lord, don't you see the suffering? Oh Lord, see your land. You know, mm -mm, we deserve the suffering. We brought it upon ourselves. Now you change. Now you can understand Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. You tell him, Lord, for us we have sinned. We deserve everything we are getting. We are suffering, but we deserve it. But you are holy. And look what we are doing to your name. We are bringing reproach to your name. For the sake of your name, have mercy. So, true intercessors don't pray from the worldly point of view. They don't look at circumstances from the surface. They are allowed by God to go look deep behind the scenes. And they can carry the burden of a God of justice. They are not dealing with a God who is not seeing. Can't you see the suffering? Oh Lord, see how much they are suffering. Look at these little children, Lord. God is not moved by sympathy. God is moved by truth. By truth. If you come with truth, he will listen to you. Amen. So, you, you think Ezekiel can just go now to God and say, Oh, why have you brought famine upon the land? <laughs> he knows why. If a pestilence comes, a plague comes, why have you allowed this? Ah, uh ah, -uh. he knows now. He cannot start from that angle. He goes to another angle. Lord, we have sinned. We have sinned against you and you are right to allow this to come to us. But then he must find another argument why God should relent and forgive and bring respite. So this is what I'm saying to you, brother, sister. You want to be a friend of God? You need to be able to share the burden of the Lord. And to be faithful. By the way, when God begins to show you things, you must be a man of, what do they call it? You must be able to keep the things God shows you. Not everything he shows you that you have got to go and speak out. Some people are so eager to appear to, so spiritual to others, they will speak everything he tells them. You know one time when we were in Luero, and I had some, in my team, I had two people I knew that the Lord had called them to be prophets. But they, are, they were still young and they were growing. He had revealed it to me, but he did, he did not tell me to tell them. So I was nurturing them, I was pastoring them, encouraging them, correcting them. Then one day we had a team come from Kampala, about 14 people. They came in a minibus to come and join us to preach the gospel over the weekend. And over that weekend, I saw two other people from the team that came from Kampala, from our mother church, and I saw these two have got a gift of prophecy. And I had never noticed it, I had never known it. And I prayed about it and the Lord said, indeed, I have chosen them. I'm going to use them prophetically. Then he began to tell me a little bit about their future. And I don't know what got into me. I called them and I told them, God has called you to be a prophet. You are going to be a prophetess and this and this and told them about everything in the future. And later on when I went to pray, the Lord said, who told you to tell them? Now, what you have done is you have put a block, a barrier in their path. You have created a, a pride which is going to take years to deal with. So you've slowed them down for years. 
I have to deal with the pride that you have created. Until that is overcome, they can no longer grow and proceed in their ministry. And he said, from today, learn. Do not be loose with words. Say only that which I tell you to say. And learn to keep things in your heart. And that taught me a lot. That taught me a lot. And it brought a lot of pain. Because I saw I have brought such a hindrance to these young people. It's, and he says it will take four or five years for them to overcome that. So even if you're a pastor, don't be rash with your words. Even if you see, ask the Lord, should I speak or not? And if he says no, bear it, bear it, bear it. Even if they don't think you are very spiritual, you don't see things in the spirit, what does that do to you? It's just people's opinion. Amen. Sometimes we want to prove to the world so much that we are so spiritual. We come out with all kinds of things and even we make up prophecies. Oh God, have mercy upon us. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do you still want to be a friend of God? Being a friend of God has got its costs. Amen. Now, there's something else I want you to yeah, Jesus taught us to pray. Take us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let me ask you a question. How many times do you go to pray and when you finish prayer, you have not even dealt with that area? You finish, you pray, you close your prayer, you go out, but you have not asked for that protection. You have not asked for that, for God to fight for you. It's very important. It's not a redundant thing. The Lord meant it. So, you, even for you, before, let me give you an example in the scriptures. In the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 20. Second Chronicles, chapter 20, we shall read from verse 7. Now here, Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat was the leader of Israel. And uh, they, they, the enemies came to attack them. And he felt he didn't have the ability to defend and so he went in verse 6, he said, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in, excuse me, in your hand there's not power. In your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever. And they dwelt in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name. Saying, if disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence for your name is in this temple. And we shall cry out to you in our afflictions and you will hear and save us. And now, here are the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt but they turned from them and did not destroy them here they are rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession which you have given us to inherit oh our God will you not judge them for we have no power against their multitudes that is coming against us nor do we know what to do but our eyes are upon you. Let me ask you, how many times are you in the middle of battles and you don't know how to fight? Maybe battles at the place of work, maybe battles in your company, maybe battles with your neighbors, maybe battles in the church. Even those, especially people who serve in the church, sometimes you're in strife with somebody and then you go and you take it upon yourself to ask, tell God what to do. God, take him out of the way. He's a problem. He's, she's the problem here. Let them, let her be sacked. Don't pray such prayers. <laughs> telling God what to do. You, you pray like this. That God won't you rise up. Let the enemies disperse. Let whoever is wrong be dispersed. Let it be his prerogative to choose what action to take. Not you to tell him. Oh, this one. Please cause him to stumble. Let them find mistakes in his books that they sack him. That is witchcraft. That's witchcraft. You are, you are pushing evil, a spell into somebody's life. Let's say God arise. 
and let the enemies disperse. Praise the name of the Lord. For the sake of time, I want to move on very quickly. Um, before you finish your prayer, and if your prayer has been one hour, two hours or more, do you ever do this? As you pray, you get to conclusions, resolutions, submissions, and all kinds of things. And at the end of the prayer, you need to take a moment and sit down and say, what are the action points I've got out of this prayer time? Like when you have a meeting, at the end of the meeting, don't you ask for action points? Because you have been talking and resolving things, deciding things. It's the same way with God. It's an encounter. It's a meeting. So at the end of it, ask yourself, what are the points, action points? Because you can forget. You can forget. Check yourself. Haven't you ever been in prayer and resolved something? And then when you come out, you don't note it down and you don't do it. And after some months, it comes back and says, oh, I had resolved this thing. I don't know what happened. Because you never took it seriously. So let us develop a practice. At, at the end of my prayer time, before I move out, let me jot down what have we agreed with God? What has he spoken to me? What have I promised him? Put those things down and purpose to follow them up with action. Otherwise, you will be promising and never doing. Receiving instructions and never obeying or obeying in half. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I'll wind up with these things. As you leave your prayer time, <laughs> tell the Lord. You know, when, when you are meeting with some people, either you have a meeting or you have a friend, wh how do you part company? You normally make arrangements for the next meeting. See you, eh? See you tomorrow at this time. Or if it's a meeting, you say, when are we meeting again? So even after you leave prayer, don't let it be open-ended. You say, Lord, I am going away now to do this work. I, I, I look forward to this time when I'll be back in your presence. Please don't let anything distract me. Don't let any problem come. Don't let anything take me away from that precious time we are going to meet. Uh, I look forward to that, my Lord. So you are protecting that time from the schemes of the devil. Amen. You're protecting that time so that nothing comes up to distract you. And something else now. As you leave your prayer time, you have already finished all those things. Remember this promise. That the promise of the Father to us is the Holy Spirit. The promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit. What is the use of the Holy Spirit? He's our helper. He's our guide. He's our teacher. He's our advocate. He's our seal of salvation. He guides us in the paths of righteousness. He reminds us of things we have forgotten. He tells us of things which are yet to come. He is all. And we need him to say, Lord, I'm leaving this place of prayer, but I need the Holy Spirit. Please let the Spirit come. The gift that you promised us. Let him come and walk with me. Let him come and do all of these things. Pray those things into your life. And now, when you leave the prayer time, be reminded you asked for the Holy Spirit to go with you. Don't forget him and treat him like a dog just coming after you. He is a friend and he is the Lord of your life. He's the Lord of the moment. Involve him in your conversations. Involve him in every decision you're going to take as you're going to decide. Hey, come on, give an ear and say, Lord, is this okay? If you're buying anything and you're bargaining for a price, let him be involved. Lord, is this okay? Let there be that joy that you are not alone. He's in your decisions. He's in your conversations. He's in your... If something bad happens, the first person to talk to is the Holy Spirit. Oh my Lord, what has happened? Look at this. Look at this. Let him be there to comfort you before men come with their worldly wisdom. If there's victory, rejoice with him. Hallelujah. Give thanks and say, Lord, I thank you. I bless you. Look at what has just happened. Oh, Holy Spirit, you are my friend. Involve him. Walk with him. You will never be lonely when you are conscious of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 
And now I want to tell you something. When you go back in the evening, you go back to your time of prayer. As I said yesterday, it's like you have come from town, come back home, you're going to talk to the people at home. They ask you, how was the day? So it's like the father says, how, is the, how was the day? Start by thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you. Because this morning when we went out, this happened. And when I was not sure what to do, the Holy Spirit guided me in this. I give you praise for the Holy Spirit. So you are telling him about the whole day. By the time you finish the story, you are bubbling and you want to go into deeper, 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 deeper things. Because you are, it's your friend. And it becomes a natural thing every day. You, you, I, I like when Benny Hinn wrote this book and says, when he wakes up, the first thing he says, good morning, Holy Spirit. Yeah, that comes when you are developing a real partnership. The moment you wake up, hey, good morning, my friend. That means the whole day you're going to be with him. You're going to be walking with him, talking with him. When you see things, you observe and say, look at that. What do people think when they're doing that? And sometimes you'll be surprised. He tells you that's what they believe because they value this and this. Oh, wow. Now I understand why the other scripture says this. You are not alone. You are with him and you love it. And then there will be those moments because it's part of the journey when he will not be there, when you will not feel him. You talk and there is no answer. You, you pull him in the spirit and you don't feel him. Why? Because he's trying to teach you something. Maybe you did something and you are so stuck in it. There's no way to stop you unless he moves away and you feel the impact of it. Then as you cry for him, he says, I'll come back only if you promise me this will stop. Yes, he does that. He teaches us in different ways. But when you have got used to this fellowship, isn't that what we pray for? And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That is what we mean. You walk with him up and down, day, day in, day out, morning to evening. You are with him. You learn how to be with him. He's more close than any friend. He's closer. And when, he's, when you don't feel him, no friendship is enough. No company of men can make it up. You are just so, so lonely among men. You want to leave people and go away to seek him. You know the Song of Songs? That book, When Your Lover Is Gone. <laughs> when that lover is gone, you don't care. You say, women of this land, leave me. I'm looking for him. You guardsmen, don't even touch me. I'm looking for my lover. My lover is my own. Hey, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell somebody, I want to be a friend of God. And it's not hard work. You can do it. You can gently learn. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Now, I said really today, what I've done is really go back and cultivate. All of this we touched yesterday. But I'm sure even today, it still comes with a freshness. Because it's something that we may not have been exercising or practicing and we need to do there there's more to becoming a friend of god but if we are not going to implement these basic ones what would it benefit to go into anything deeper amen so i am going to trust that the lord will help you to get deeper into these things make them your own listen to these teachings over and over again you cannot take it in all at once so listen to them over and over and each time pick up something to implement pick up something to implement and let us go in faith we will be a people who know their god and who will be strong and will work exploits this is the breed that the lord is raising up in these last days the breed that will stand against all the storms and the tribulations and will bring a worthy testimony of the Lord to the nations of the world in these last days. And I pray that you and I shall be part of that in the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to bless you so much. I want to thank that the Lord that who is doing this deep work in our lives. Let us continue to communicate. If you have any questions, send them um, on to the platform. We will try our best to answer them. And let me ask Gideon to come and lead us now into a time of worship. And I want you to worship with one commitment. Lord, I am going to seek you. I will become your friend. I will live as your friend. I don't want to be a stranger to you. And I don't want to be distant to you. Let this be our determination. Hallelujah. 
Amen. God bless you so much.